Temperature at the time of drone flight, a warm 87 degrees under fair skies. And there is a little bit of cirrus out there, rather than just ignore it because the weather is fair. We always want to know where this stuff comes from. And for that, we're going to go to the satellite photo. This shows that patchy cloud over North Texas. If we run that back through last night into yesterday evening, we can see that that came from New Mexico, where we've had afternoon thunderstorms develop. And due to the prevailing westerlies being in place, it's carrying that moisture and debris downstream. So rather than New Mexico having a mostly cloudy night, they cleared out. Texas got the moisture, and New Mexico, they had clear skies, which set the stage for another round of thunderstorm activity. Now, here's one way we can visualize it. This is the 300 millibar relative humidity chart. This is going to be up at about 30,000 feet near the top of the troposphere. So there's a lot of residual moisture from those anvils. We run that forward. This is last night's model. We go forward to midnight then 6 a.m., then noon. You can see a lot of that moisture made it into the north part of Texas. And depending on where you are, relative humidity is at that layer, running anywhere from 50 to 90%. The current surface chart for today, June 12th, 2020, showing high pressure extending from central Canada all the way down through the Midwest and down to Texas and Oklahoma. This time of year, I would consider that to be the significant feature appearing on the chart. That's a vast mass of cold air extending down to the Great Lakes. You can see temperatures down to 70 at Chicago, 71 at Detroit. Now that high pressure does extend all the way down to Texas with a front being driven often in the Gulf, but there's been extensive modification of that air mass as a result, instead of lower 90s, mid 90s, we've got temperatures only in the mid 80s. So it doesn't seem like much, but we are getting a break. The other factor is the depressed dew points. 50 is just about everywhere you look from, say, Alabama to Dallas. And this time of year, that's definitely a big thing. We had dew points last week around 75 to 76 here, and I've got the dehumidifier off. And that's a remarkable achievement here. Out west, you can see a very well-defined heat low developing. That's centered in the Idaho, eastern Oregon area. Not quite in the Arizona region where we typically find it. So we've got a pretty deep southerly flow going through, say, Las Vegas, Tonopah, St. George, Kingman. West Coast looking a little bit cooler. I think we've probably had a slight influx of cooler air coming from the Pacific. Temperatures only in the upper 70s and low 80s through the San Joaquin Valley. And I think I should check the GFS, make sure we have not had frontal passage. Yes, I think we have had frontal passage. Yeah, see all that packing of thickness lines. So, yeah, we need to stick that in there. Okay, is that better? Yeah, that's what it looks like to me, and we, we need to drop that air mass in there. There we go. Some maritime polar air working its way into San Francisco, Stockton, Sacramento, and the cold pool right offshore there off Mendocino and Fort Bragg. Now, usually in the wintertime, we see this frontal boundary way down to Mexico start receding northward. Starts approaching the Big Bend area. We see the clouds developing up slope flow. But the air mass modification this time of year is so powerful that we're just going to see this convert right over to a hot air mass. As eventually as we get the return flow developing on the Gulf, that will bring the moisture in. Also, evapotranspiration will modify the air mass somewhat. And we'll start seeing dew points coming up in the I-35 area out to East Texas, and then infiltrating West Texas. That'll probably take a couple of days for that to happen. So we have this frontal system that has passed the Northeast U.S. 
So what do we see here? Mostly kind of a wind shift. This gets into something about scales. Let's take a look at the frontal system from the global perspective. Okay, this is a chart showing the 500 millibar heights as red, green, yellow shading. We also have the sea level pressure shown as black lines. So let's scroll down to North America. What do we see? Well, you remember how I was telling you that high pressure seems to dominate the central U.S. And there we can see it. There's kind of a spider web of high pressure right there. So what about that frontal system in New England? Well, I can see the isobars kind of indented a little bit like that. So you might want to drop a front within that trough. And we can also see that with the height coloring kind of packed together in that area, there's a jet stream being indicated through that region. So that would be supporting that front. And a similar thing showing up on the west coast, jet running through that area. In fact, they just kind of connect together. So there is a frontal system likely on the west coast. And if we use our rule of thumb, going upstream from a ridge and downstream from a trough. See, there's a trough, there's the ridge. That would put a frontal system, I'm going to put that in yellow. Probably right through there, which matches well with the surface data. And likely another frontal system kind of in here. That's just kind of a very rough preliminary look. You know, we know to look for it in those areas. They may not actually look like this. So, our, yeah, our surface system is in there. And it, it likely connects back up to the north as a occlusion because we're not going to find warm fronts and cold fronts way up there north of the jet. That's a graveyard there for weather systems. So we don't see much detail on that frontal system there in New England. It just looks like a big trough. What if we zoom in and take a look at things a little more closely? Well, if we zoom right in on the continental U.S., I can see that trough a little bit better. It looks like there's one right there, and there's another one through here. Now, e either of those could be the frontal system. In fact, going by this, I would say this is probably the cold front. And I think the warm front would be extending maybe up through here. Possibly even a little further north. And what if we go all the way in? Yeah, by the way, thanks to Tropco Tidbits for these maps. Let's go right into the northeast U.S. And there we've got even, a, even more detail. So there's that one trough right there, probably representing the front. And that other trough, I mean, we can pretty much isolate that right down to the counties. What we've shown you is a very basic introduction to mesoscale versus synoptic scale. This is a kind of a mesoscale look at the weather. And this is a synoptic scale look at the weather. You're not going to really see any mesoscale features. That's because they occupy different scales of space and time. Here's a graph showing the different scales of weather systems. Now, obviously, those charts looking at the North American and Northern Hemispheric view, those are going to pick up systems in the, this scale right here, 100 up to maybe 10,000 kilometers. So that's going to capture hurricanes, tropical storms to a certain extent. Definitely going to capture highs, lows, long waves, but not land and sea breezes, not thunderstorms, not tornadoes. So this is all synoptic scale. Now down in the, say, 10 to, I would say, 500 kilometer range, this is the mesoscale. So this includes hurricanes, tropical storms, also a lot of your larger thunderstorms. Most land and sea breezes, it's going to capture that. So when you're looking at those zoomed-in views, like this right here, you're going to get some mesoscale detail as long as you have a model that is running at mesoscale resolution, such as the high resolution rapid refresh, the higher resolution WRF runs, and surprisingly, even some of the global models are running at mesoscale resolution. The other factor is you have to have output from the models that is res 
mesoscale in resolution. You can see that in digital atmosphere, this has not been released yet, but it shows that with the GFS right here, you can get grids that are 140 kilometers in scale. So that means anything smaller than that, you're going to be missing a lot of detail on. So it's not going to pick up thunderstorms very well. So even though the model might be handling it okay, it's not going to display with this kind of grid. You would have to pull out these more detailed grids, like 27 kilometers. But as you drill down, you're dealing with bulkier and bulkier data sets. And some of those full model data sets are up in the gigabytes. Now, one way you can get around that is to go to a model website that handles that stuff at the full resolution of the model. But anyway, we're getting off track. Uh, the general idea. So models do have a certain spatial scale. In other words, the size of the features that it's handling. They also have a time scale, which is very important. And that tends to follow kind of a linear relationship there. So generally, the bigger the weather systems, the longer the scales that they occupy. Yeah, it's time to show a little bit of math. This is the momentum equation for motion. And what this is telling us is that the change in velocity over time is controlled by all of these components here. Now this here is the density. We can kind of ignore that. That kind of stays the same. Friction, we can kind of keep that the same. And that boils us down to these two right here. This is pressure gradient. Okay, and this is Coriolis parameter. Which is controlled by the velocity of the moving parcel. Now this is going to kind of remain constant in the area that we're using for this little thought experiment, which leads us to this right here, the pressure gradient term. This is the change in pressure over a certain change in distance. Obviously, if you've been around weather, you can kind of understand that pressure gradient forces the change in pressure over a unit change of distance. Now, if we look at weather across the U.S., 1008 millibars out in Utah, 1024 in Texas. So we've got a change of about 14 or 15 millibars over 1,000 kilometers. Can the models handle that very well? Yeah, definitely. This is well resolved by dynamical models that we have. So... Well, you've probably seen the diagrams of flow in a thunderstorm. You've got a thunderstorm right here producing high pressure near the surface and sometimes a little wake low out behind it. What are the exact pressures in a thunderstorm? Well, here's an example of a barograph for St. Louis on June 27, 2011, when they had a bow echo pass through the area. And you can see there's a change of almost 0.20 inches. That's about 8 millibars. So here, 8 millibars over a scale of what's probably miles. That's a pretty huge pressure gradient. And if we go back to this, this pretty much overwhelms the contribution of Coriolis force. Well, some of you may have seen these surface analyses that have the geostrophic wind scale printed on them. And that's where you can take the contour intervals like here, here. And you take the distance between the two, find your latitude, and that gives you the geostrophic winds. In this case, it looks like the example is about 25 knots. Well, if you took that storm sample there that's got 7 millibars across maybe 5 miles, which is about four miles for four millibars, you would be way up in this range right here, like winds of 200 to 300 knots. So obviously that's not the case. We don't have 200 knot winds at the surface. 
And that's because those kinds of small-scale winds are not driven by the geostrophic balance. So mesoscale models have to be able to account for those kinds of processes and not strictly look at weather systems in terms of Coriolis force and pressure gradient. And that's one reason why mesoscale models are so sophisticated. They have to account for a wide variety of processes and also handle the mathematical noise that develops in those types of solutions. And we'll take a look at a Europe since there is some weather out there. We've got one or two viewers that are pretty vocal about showing a Europe. And I need to emphasize we'll try to do that, but there's only so much time to do these weather casts and we can't get to all the material that we would like to. So let's see what's going on out there. Well, for one thing, the thickness, which is in red, you can see that overlies this very deep weather system. So this is some sort of occlusion that's sitting off the western French coast. In the main jet stream, we can see that in the thickness field. See those red lines? That jet stream pretty much lies right in that little corridor. And that's probably helping to sustain these showers. And not only that, it's likely that there's some sort of frontal system that's just to the south of that jet. So just going quickly forward, looks like some showers develop over Germany over the weekend. Now, where is that coming from? Now, what I would do is look at the dew points. And I'm not seeing any dew points on this map, so we're going to go to Pivotal Weather. Now, the dew point is important because that tells me if there's surface-based parcels involved, if there's convection, and if there's a healthy moisture supply. And there I can see, yeah, there's a moist sector across northern Germany. Down to the south, though, it is fairly dry. Let's look at the evolution of this system. This is for this evening, and we'll run this forward. It appears that our moisture supply is coming from Poland, and it's moving towards the west. And you can see dew points near 66 Fahrenheit, which is way up there. So we're going to look at some parcels. This is going to be for midday on Saturday. This is over Germany. And we can see some decent cape in that area. See that good steep lapse right there? The moisture has some depth, about 100 millibars of depth. There's definitely an absence of capping. So any cells that go up, they're just going to go up everywhere. And then the lifted parcels are just going to rise as soon as we kick in that heating. We get that long skinny cape there. Moderate values of about 1500. And you can see practically no convective inhibition. Now as far as tornadoes, we do see weak wind profiles. The winds are pretty well backed and a lot of it is coming out of the southeast. So any cells that develop are going to move southeast to northwest. You can also use this plot of storm relative winds. We do see some favorable cells. We're just in the moderate range there for the low level inflow and mid level storm relative flow. And if any cells were to become severe, they would be in that HP spectrum since there's little anvil relative shear. So this environment in northern Germany does look favorable. And let's just take a quick look down south around Frankfurt and compare that. And there we see the moisture is weaker, 54 degree dew points. And if we try to lift a parcel, we're not going to get much positive area at all. You can see the capes are a lot lower. So it does look like a storm day, you know, so often happens. There's probably going to be a lot of clouds. And if there's a good amount of mid and high cloud covering the area, that's going to reduce the solar heating. And you're going to have storms that are more mushy and stratiform. And the cape values will be lower. So starting out early in the day, it looks like we have early convection there. West of Berlin and then by evening, some pretty stout showers there, I guess. Uh, I don't know my geography there. I guess it's between Hamburg and Berlin. And I would expect a few of those to possibly be severe. Anyway, I hope that gives you a quick look there at Europe. We can't do this every day. Usually I'm pretty distracted by trying to add in other content, but maybe that'll give you some idea what's coming up. 
Yep, two inch precipitable water over eastern Germany. So if I was going to be looking to chase, I'd probably want to be up there in northern Germany. And after that, it's just going to come down to the mesoscale setup. Go back to basics like we do on all the weather casts here and do your important surface analysis and use whatever visible satellite imagery you can get. But things are going to be uncapped. So once it goes up, it's going to be storms everywhere. And probably numerous multi-cell complexes going on. Lots of storm interaction. Okay, that's about all I have for today. This is Friday, so this is going to be the last video until Tuesday. Unless you're a Patreon supporter. In that case, we're going to come back at you on Monday with a special private video. We'll cover some more forecasting basics and find some content to make it worth your while. So go to this patreon.com slash metlab if you want to get signed up for that. And you'll be in there immediately once it goes through. And you'll get your video on Monday. Otherwise, we'll see you all on Tuesday. Take care and have a great weekend.